I hesitate to say that some places are a, a house of horrors, some places are tougher to play, or some places Pitt just seems to be cursed. But there's something about North Carolina. There's something about playing at Chapel Hill, playing a football game in Chapel Hill that just doesn't work out for the Panthers. Pitt has never won playing at North Carolina, and their four games playing against the Tar Heels in Chapel Hill since joining the ACC in 2013, they're all particularly bad, <laughs> particularly uh, sort of heartbreaking all in their own ways and and pretty, uh, yeah, they're bad losses. And Pitt has taken four of them. They're 0-4 playing in Chapel Hill since joining the conference. Why is that? Why does Pitt have such a hard time winning at North Carolina? For football, at least. Basketball has at least gotten a little bit of success down there. But for football, why has playing in Chapel Hill been such a challenge? Let's talk about that and also a follow-up on something we talked about earlier in this week. I'm not going to spend the entire episode talking about bad losses at North Carolina. We've got something else I need to follow up on because it's an important piece of relevant context for a topic we talked about uh, a couple days ago. But to start off, we're going to talk about this issue with Chapel Hill. Why it's so tough for Pitt playing at North Carolina. Why they've had such struggles and haven't been able to win a game down there. And then we'll talk about something more positive here on the Morning Pit. Thursday edition on YouTube.com slash Pantholericom. Yeah, Pitt is 0-7 playing against the North Carolina Tar Heels in Chapel Hill. They're 5-12 and all time against North Carolina. So it's not exactly a series that has favored Pitt. But when you take the game out of North Carolina, you played in Pittsburgh. You can do the math there. 5-12 and overall, 0-7 on the road. Well, you could figure it out. 5-5 five and five at home for Pitt against North Carolina. But it's been an issue down there. And it's been an issue... I mean, every time. I mean, the first three games, you know, they played there in 1974, they played there in 1979, and they played there in 1998. So a pretty big, you know, 25-year span there, 25, you know, from, from 74 to 98. But more recently, Pitt has been playing in Chapel Hill as a member of the ACC Conference. Well, not ACC Conference. I hate it when people do that. It's not the Atlantic Coast Conference Conference. It's the ACC. Pitt joined in 2013, made their first trip to Chapel Hill in 2014, and since then they have lost – Four games at North Carolina. And why is it? You know, they didn't go in 2020, or else it might be five games that they've lost at North Carolina. 2020, they were scheduled to go to North Carolina, and then the uh, COVID year rescheduling of everything ended up taking that game off of Pitt's schedule. Uh, got replaced by, like, Clemson or something, <laughs> which is not exactly a fair trade, but who knows? Maybe it ended up being, uh, maybe it would have been better to play uh, Carolina than Clemson that year. Either way. It doesn't matter. Why is Pitt 0-4 since joining the conference, playing at North Carolina? Let's look at those look at those games and figure out kind of what happened in those four. Of course, you know what we always ask you to do? Like this video and subscribe, youtube.com slash pantheleric.com. The subscribe button right down there. That way you won't miss any of our Pitt video content here on youtube.com slash pantheleric.com, whether it's these daily morning Pitt videos, our weekly live show that we do every Wednesday night like we did last night at 8.30 p.m. with me and Jim Hammett talking to you about Pitt sports, or our live post-game show, which we'll have on Sun Saturday night. Uh, Pitt plays at North Carolina on Saturday at noon. We'll be live probably around 8 o'clock or so. Uh, to give you the post-game show and recap and talk about what happened. We'll stay live for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, however long it takes to uh, get a few drinks and have a few conversations about Pitt, North Carolina, and what this game brings. I I'm really, like, I'll, I'll say this. Like, before we talk about the last four years, I, I got to tell you, I am really looking forward to this game. Like, really, really looking forward to this game. Because this team, this Pitt team, has surprised me quite a bit through their first four games of the season. There have been a lot of things that have happened that have surprised me considerably. Most of them revolving around the offense, at least in terms of positive surprises. Uh, I, I, you know, the offense itself, the effectiveness of the offense, has been a very pleasant surprise. You know, a very positive surprise for Pitt. Obviously, the play of Eli Holstein, the playmaking ability of Desmond Reed, how Kanate Mumfield has really come into his own in his senior year, how Poppy Williams and Sincere Lee have translated, Kenny Johnson taking a big step as a second-year player, as a sophomore wide receiver, looking like the guy that you, you, you were kind of hoping and believing he might be. You know, all positive surprises, all positive experience, you know, for, for this team 
through four games. And defensively, maybe not as many positive surprises, but I think certainly the linebackers have been a, a very positive development and, you know, you like seeing how they've done. So a lot of, you know, pleasant surprises for this team through the first four games. And now after an off week, not that the other games don't count, but I mean, this is, this is really it. Like this is the real deal. Holy field of the final eight games, the ACC schedule. This is where it'll be proven what this pit team really is and who they really are. And then not just this week, but over each of these eight games is when we'll really find out who this pit team is. And for the fact, you know, the, the fact that it is starting, that this eight game run starts with a trip to North Carolina, a place they have never won against a team that has given them trouble ever since they joined the ACC. Remember, it took them until 2019 before they finally beat North Carolina. They lost the first six games, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. They lost the first six games in North Carolina, all in like ridiculous fashion. I mean, like every one of those six games was was ridiculous one way or the other. I can remember back to like 2013 and and you know the home games that they lost 13 and 15 and 17 I mean 2017 and 18 were bad North Carolina teams they only beat I, I'm you know North Carolina in 2017 and 18 only had I think two wins over power conference opponents and they were both against Pitt I mean it was the only games they won of consequence those two years for some reason Pitt just could not beat Larry Fedora now you know, Fedora leaves, uh, Mac Brown comes in and Pitts had a little bit more success. They won in 2019. They won in 2021. Obviously they lost in, uh, 22 and 23. Uh, so they're two and two against Mac Brown, but nevertheless, uh, it took a long time for Pitt to get off the schneid against North Carolina. They finally did it in 2019, but they still haven't broken the curse of playing down there. And so for the, you know, to have this game, be the, the gateway to the ACC schedule, to this eight-game stretch that's going to define the season for Pitt, define you know a season that has already exceeded expectations to this point and has a chance to really exceed expectations and really end up being a, a, a really good season. You know I mean? If they can build on the things they've done, that's a huge opportunity in front of them, and it starts at a place where they have struggled to find success. Now, what's interesting about the games in Chapel Hill – since 2013 is that Pitt has struggled to find success overall. They haven't been able to get a win, but they've had some sort of specific success. And by that, I mean, within games, it's not like they've gotten blown out every time they went to Chapel Hill. Now they lost the last time they went down there in 2022, they lost to Drake may uh, by 18. It was a 42, 24 game, but that game, just like the game in 2018, just like the game in 2016, and the game in 2014, in all four of Pitt's trips to Chapel Hill since joining the ACC, the Panthers have led at halftime. Every single one. 2014, they were up 21-13. 2016, they were up 19-16. 2018, they were up by a touchdown, 28-21. And in 2022, they had a 17-14 lead at the half. In three out of those four games, 2014, 2016, and 2022, Pitt had a lead in the fourth quarter. 2014, they were up by two, 28-26 at the beginning of the fourth quarter. 2016, they had a 10-point lead in the fourth quarter, 33-23. And 2022, they were up 24-21. They had a field goal lead to start the fourth quarter, in case you forgot how that game went. Because I think you look back, I look back on that 2022 game, and I see it was an 18-point win for North Carolina. I remember Drake May played for North Carolina. Josh Downs played for North Carolina, uh, you know, who was very good. Uh, you know, it still is. We just saw him play against the Steelers a couple days ago and saw how good he is. I picked him up for fantasy football because he's a really good football player. And he was against Pitt that day, made some big plays. We'll talk about in a second, but I think I look back on that game in 2022 and I see an 18 point win and I see, you know, Drake may played and, you know, put up Drake may numbers and, you know, Kalaja can't got ejected for targeting, I think in the first half. So he didn't play at all after halftime. Uh, and, and I look back and think, oh, yeah, well, that that was the game that was just kind of a blowout. Because the others, the final scores of the first three games that Pitt played in Chapel Hill after they joined the Converts, the first one, 2014, was a 40-35 to 35 game, five-point game. The 2016 game, which might have been the biggest, like, heartbreak of them all, was 37-36, right? It was a one-point win for North Carolina. 2018 
was a field goal win. It was a 38-35 game. And so, you know, you have these one-score games, and then you've got this 42-24 thing in 2022. And so you think, oh, that was that was the year they actually blew them out. But they really didn't because Pitt, again, had a lead starting the fourth quarter. So what happened in the fourth quarter of that game? Well, it was kind of like what happened in almost all of these games where Pitt just blew it. Now, we're not going to take anything away from what North Carolina did in those games uh, because they had big-time players who made big-time plays. Marquise Williams and Mitch Trubisky. Uh, in 2018, I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then, obviously, Drake May in 2022. Uh, they had good players. You know, I mean, there's there's no question about that. North Carolina engineered those comeback wins, fourth-quarter comeback wins in three out of these four games, second-half comeback wins in all four games. But Pitt blew it every time. Every time. 2022, they've got a field goal lead to start the fourth quarter. North Carolina scores a touchdown and goes up 28-24, all right? Still, you know, four four point game in the fourth quarter pits down, but it's a four point game. It's no by no stretch is it out of reach until Izzy Abanikanda fumbles. North Carolina recovers and they score three plays later. All right? Now it's 35-24. Now you're down by 11. Now it's a bit of a problem. Next drive, Pitt comes out. Keaton Slovis throws three straight incomplete passes. Okay, that's not good to go three and out. You're starting to squander possessions in time. But the game really gets out of reach when Cam Guess punts after the three incompletions and it goes 33 yards. And Josh Downs returns the punt 23 yards. Carolina scores three plays later. So you you have this three-point lead to start the fourth quarter. It turns into a four-point deficit, but it's okay And then Carolina scores two touchdowns on six plays. And now the game is out of reach. Now it's 42-24 because you had a fumble and a bad punt. Shooting yourself in the foot. Uh, 2016, we know how that game went. Again, there was a three-point lead for Pitt at halftime, a 10-point lead for Pitt in the fourth quarter. Uh, They were still up 36-30 in the final minute. And Mitch Trubisky drives them down the field. Now, we all talk about Pitt's defense and how they blew it in that game, gave up the fourth Fourth down play to Ryan Switzer, um, which may or may not should have been an offensive pass interference. Nevertheless, there's a certain other reality. For as much as we romanticize that pit offense in 2016, as much as we talk about how great it was and it was the best, you know, now, you know, second best offense of the pit era, uh, of the Narduzzi era, I should say, after the 2021 offense, you know, TBD on the uh, 2024 group, but you know we talk about that 2016 offense, but they they failed a number of times in that fourth quarter when they could have gotten some first downs to keep Mitch Trubisky on the sidelines. They they fell short. Ultimately, the defense had to get a stop. Both sides of the ball kind of blew it at the end there uh, to lose that one. 2014, you know we talked about an eight point lead at halftime, two point lead to start the fourth quarter. Pitt had a one point lead, 35-34. When James Conner scored a touchdown with three and a half minutes left to go, and, and he really like carried the way, right? Pitt was was down 34-28 or whatever it was. James Conner comes out on 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 you know this this what should have been a game. Uh, it was a go ahead touchdown drive, five carries for 51 yards and a touchdown. Scored like a 22 yard touchdown run to put Pitt up by a point. And then Marquise Williams was running all over the place, picked up a couple first downs, and ultimately led to the touchdown to lose to, to win the game for Carolina, forty to thirty-five. The 2018 game was was a disaster because Carolina was bad. Again, Pitt had a lead at halftime. They cut the lead to three points with three minutes left to go, and then they just couldn't stop Carolina's rushing attack. Carolina gained two first downs on the run in the final three minutes to run out the clock and ice the game and and end up with a three-point win. So what do we take away from these games? What can we say about why Pitt lost at North Carolina each of those times? Each one was different, uh, but I think it's pretty interesting and notable that Pitt had a halftime lead in all of them, had a fourth-quarter lead in three out of the four, and in the one where they didn't have a fourth-quarter lead, they had the game within three points with three minutes left to go. All opportunities to win the game, to either ice it in the fourth quarter or come back and win it in the fourth quarter. And and they blew it in unique ways each time. Now, I think you're going to get some interesting officiating when you play North Carolina in Chapel Hill. That's always going to be the case. Um, And you're going to have to contend with that 
and and, and you're going to have to deal with it and understand that that's probably going to be at play. Although in in a lot of these games, I mean, looking at it, Pitt had four penalties, five penalties, uh, and and the fourth quarters where these games were ultimately decided weren't really decided on penalties. As a matter of fact, I think the 2018 game. Pitt scored a touchdown to cut the lead to three. There were two reviews that both worked out in Pitt's favor. There was a Taysier Mack call that I think was ruled incomplete and and overturned. And then there was Maurice French scored a touchdown that was ruled complete and confirmed. Uh, or, or maybe it was the other way around that Mack had a catch that was confirmed on replay and French had an incomplete pass that was turned into a touchdown on replay but either way there were two replays that worked in Pitt's favor so penalties didn't decide the final the final four you know the final quarters of these games unless there were plays that just weren't called penalties that weren't called which I guess could also be the case but it was ultimately a matter of Pitt not making plays and I mean I think if you think about those teams 2014 2016 2018 2022 they all ended up where they ended up 2014 as a six and seven season 2016 an eight and five season 2018 a seven and seven season and 22 and nine and four season you know those teams all had different outcomes to their seasons but i i think you know the reasons they lost some of those games kind of bleed over into the reasons they lost or won other games they had that year and so those games were to some extent microcosms of, of part of what happened in the bigger picture of those seasons now we've seen this year's pit team engineer two fourth quarter comebacks and put their foot on the throat against a couple of inferior opponents in Kent State and Youngstown State. Does that mean this team is uniquely prepared or uniquely, uh, you know, adaptable to this kind of game that if they get into a fourth, a game that comes down to the fourth quarter, like the other four have, are they going to be better prepared to handle it? Possibly, you know, possibly you're talking about games where Pitt either needed to hold on to a lead or come back in the fourth quarter. And those four teams were not able to do it. This team has shown that it can play in the fourth quarter a little bit. So maybe they'll be better prepared to handle it. And, and none of the, you know, we haven't really talked about this North Carolina team in particular, but that's because each of those four North Carolina teams were different. Each one had a different starting quarterback. Each one was varying levels of good or bad. Um, and, and so each of those games was different, but they all had sort of these overlapping tones of, blowing a halftime lead in most cases blowing a fourth quarter lead uh, you know so if they run into that situation again can they handle it better now I also wanted to follow up on something we talked about on Tuesday I talked a lot about the third down issues on Tuesday about Pitt on third down I, I think they're about 19 of 43 on the season on third down which is 44 45 percent or so which is pretty solid but they're only five of 19 against West Virginia and Cincinnati, 26%, which is not very good. Someone asked about, well, what about the down and distance? What about the distance on those third downs? Are they facing particularly long third downs? And they actually are. Pitt's average distance faced on third down this season is seven plus yards. And that's like sort of evenly split. Like it's not heavily balanced in the West Virginia Cincinnati game. Like, oh, that's 10 plus and the other games are five plus or three plus. It's actually... When you look at the West Virginia Cincinnati games, the average distance faced on third down is about 7.6 yards or so. Uh, when you look at the Youngstown State Kent State games, it's right around 7.3 or something like that. So, regardless uh, of however you want to calculate it, um, they are facing third down distances of about third, you know, seven yards or more, which is long. You don't want to be in those situations. You don't want that to be your average third down distance face. So maybe that's part of the problem on third down. However, there's another element as well, because when we talked about that, we talked about, you know, seven yards faced on third down. One of the responses on the message boards was, well, okay. So maybe the, it's not just about being bad on third down. It's about not being very good on first and second down. I thought, well, that's an interesting idea. Maybe that is more of the part. They need to have more success on first and second down. Except, check out this stat. Pitt is dead last in the ACC. Now, you might be thinking, oh, God, what is this stat going to be? But it's actually a good thing to be last in. Pitt is dead last in the ACC in third down attempts. All right, think about that for a second. They are last in the ACC in third down attempts. Well, what does that tell you? It tells me they can win. Um, it tells me they're having success on the first and second down plays. 
Because not only are they dead last in third down attempts, they're second in the conference in first downs per game. Cade Bell told us uh, before the season started, he wanted Pitt to lead the nation in first downs and how many first downs they gain. Right now, they're second in the conference in first downs per game. So when you're doing a great job picking up a lot of first downs and you're at the bottom in the number of third downs faced, <laughs> face, third downs faced, that tells me you are having a lot of success on first and second down. You're not facing a lot of third downs. You're keeping the ball moving down the field. And obviously, like your points per game are going to tell the ultimate story of how effective your offense is. But when you dig a little bit deeper inside some of these things about how you're building drives, about how you're sustaining drives, about how your offense is moving the ball down the field, they're doing it with big gains on first and second down. Like Pitt has faced, I think, 44 third downs this season. There are teams in the ACC that have faced 80. So like literally half as many third downs. Now, that's a total number. Pitt's played four games. Some teams have played five. Maybe if you break it down on per average. But, you know, account allowing for that, having the fewest third downs faced and the second most first downs per game tells me that you're having success on first and second down. This team's attacking on first and second down, and they're having success on first and second down, and it's a big part of why they're moving the ball. So I talked on Tuesday about uh, issues on third down. They got to fix it. This is my biggest problem with the offense. The more I looked into it, I think that that other stuff about first and second down success is important for context to understand this offense. So we're watching this game on Saturday. If they're getting those gains on first and second down and they're they're not getting to third down often, if you're having these drives where it's first down, first down, second down, first down, first down, second down, first down, second down, first down, you know what I mean? Where you're not really ending up in third down. I mean, that's the best place to be. You know, like that's the best place to be to not even like, not even face third down at all. You're not sure if your offense is good or not on third down. There's a solution. Don't go to third down. Get your first down on first down, right? So I think that's important to keep in mind. And I think it it, it changes the perspective of the offense and how they've done, um, you know, and it adds extra context to when we talk about Pitt's third down success or lack thereof. So I thought that was interesting. And I thought it was important to bring that up. All right. Tomorrow, we get the mailbag. If you want to submit a question for the mailbag, go to the Between Fifth and Forbes message board on Panthalore.com and uh, look for the mailbag post. Put your uh, questions in that thread and we'll answer as many as we can in the mailbag tomorrow. I was look forward to that. So get your questions in. I love it when you guys do that. Don't forget, we have the post game show Saturday night at 8 o'clock. We'll be right here at youtube.com slash Panthalore.com for the live post game show to talk about Pitt, North Carolina. I'm really excited about this game. Really looking forward to it. Not because I think one thing, one outcome or the other is going to happen, because I'm just really excited to see what outcome arrives. I, I'm interested to see what this Pitt team does with its biggest test of the season. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean that I think Carolina is better than West Virginia or Cincinnati. I don't know if they are or not. But I think it's the biggest test of the season because it's a road conference game in a place where they've never won against a team that has historically, even under a lot of different circumstances, given them quite a bit of trouble. So looking forward to seeing how this one plays out. I think you probably are too. And then I'm looking forward to talking about it after the game. We'll be here on uh, Saturday night at 8 o'clock right here at YouTube.com slash PantheLurk.com. So make sure you like this video and subscribe. YouTube.com slash PantheLurk.com. You never miss any of our pit video content. We would love it if you do that. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I hope you've had a great week so far. It's Thursday. Enjoy your Thursday. It's almost the end of the week, folks. We'll catch up with you tomorrow for the morning pit mailbag right here on YouTube.com slash PantheLurk.com.